Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. You guys ready for some New Year's motivation? All right, so I got to warn you, I'm going to get a little passionate this morning, because what we're going to talk about this morning is how they said it's my jam. We're going to talk about something that I'm super passionate about it, and if I start ranting, screaming, sweating, just know it's because I'm excited about it, okay? So hopefully I won't. But uh, we're going to be talking about, you know, this, our, our, our theme for the whole year is this idea of run. And I don't know about you, but I feel like for the last two years, we haven't really been able to run. It's kind of been like, start, stop, no, nope, start, no, nope, no, nope. okay, we can, no, nope, uh, and I'm like, for people like me, that drives me insane. You know, there's something that psychological in our minds about looking at a goal and moving towards it. A lot of the pleasure, in fact, psychologically, a lot of the pleasure we derive in life comes from setting a goal and seeing ourselves moving towards it. Oftentimes, there's more pleasure in moving towards it than when you actually get the goal. Some of y'all know what that's like. You're like, I got the thing I wanted, and actually, I enjoyed going for it more than actually getting it. Now I've got it. Now what do I do? I need something else to aim for. There's something about finding something in the distance like some idea of perfection and moving towards it. We're going to talk about that today. A um, few years ago, this time of year, I was really struggling with this cedar that we have here, this wonderful, beautiful mountain cedar that just sends to kind of like hang out in the, in the air. And I was complaining to my uncle about it. I was like, man, it's all over my car. And he's like, oh, no, it's not the stuff that's on your car that'll kill you. It's the stuff you can't see. I was like, oh, that's great. Thanks. But I was so sick as a dog from cedar. Anyways, right in the middle of that, I was like, Lord, I need some New Year's resolutions. And I hate making resolutions because, you know, how that goes, right? But uh, I felt like the Lord said, I want you to start fasting. And I was like, oh, no, no. <laughs> Clearly, that was no, not the Lord. You know, the, the devil appears as an angel of light. So I was like, <clears throat> that's a Bible verse. So I'm like, that was not the Lord. That was the devil. But I really felt like this thing, I need to fast now. Here's the thing with fasting with me, okay? So fasting, no food. Like, there's all kinds of fasts. You know, you can fast media. Like, it's just cutting something out of your life. That's a Christian term for cutting something out of your life for a spiritual reason. Typically, fasting is food uh, throughout the years. But I'd, I just, man, in the past, when I would go to fast, it made me less godly than when I, when, when I was not fasting, I would get grouchy and irritable. Anybody relate to that? Like, if you have to do it, like, you know, you've got a colonoscopy coming up or something, you're like, you can't eat for 24 hours, and you're like, oh, my God. That was me. I was like, I cannot fast, Lord. In fact, sometimes, you know, I used to set out for, to do, like, a three-day fast, and I'd get through maybe a day, day and a half of it, which always made me wonder if I'm a half-fast Christian. Like, half-fast, <laughs> half-fast Christian. Some of y'all, it's still clicking in. But uh, it always made me wonder. I'm like, so am I weak? Like, what's my deal? And I'm like, I just can't do it. So I, I, I realized, okay, I need, to, I need to start small. What's, what can I do? So I was like, like kind of praying, and I'm like, Lord, what should I do? And I felt like I, I read a thing that said the early Christians always fasted on Fridays. So I was like, Friday, all right, I'm going to do it. I'm going to fast. So I, I built up my energy, and you know, the night before I started fasting, I just ate as much food as I can. Just like, <laughs> and the next day, I was great until about 10.30 in the morning. <laughs> it was miserable. It was as horrible as I had expected it to be. And I was grouchy, and I got a headache, and I was like, <laughs> but I made it through that evening until 6 o'clock, which is when I'd finished my meal the night before. So I'd fasted all night. And that's, by the way, it's the easier way to do it, right? Well, the next day, or the next week, it was Friday again, and I'm like, oh, no, Friday again. I'm like, Lord, I was like, I felt like I really needed to do it. So I started doing it. Here, here's the long story short. My body started, like, craving Fridays. I, you know, ever had that where you're like, you know your body just wants this? Like, on Thursday nights, I'd be like, I don't have to eat tomorrow. Yes. And my body started looking forward to it. Now, this is complete change because I, I, I was never a guy. I mean, I'm 40. This is, I, I started fasting when I was 40, right? Couldn't make it up. I just couldn't do it until that point. And I started doing it. And, and then I started, I read another thing that said a lot of Christians would also fast on Wednesday and Friday. So I was like, I'm going to add Wednesday in. So I started fasting on Wednesday. And all of a sudden, a bunch of health problems I had been having started going away. Some of my, like, the allergies that used to take me out, they didn't take me out quite as much anymore. I noticed that the next year, and I was commenting to a, to a doctor about it, and she's like, yeah, that's, 
That's because here's how your body works. Your body is made to take a bit of starvation. In fact, if, if we couldn't handle a little starvation, none of us would be here because throughout history, most of us haven't eaten quite as well as what we eat, right? Most of the world hasn't. Like you go kill a, a woolly mammoth and you eat really good for a couple weeks, right? <laughs> then you gotta starve until you kill another woolly mammoth, right? That's how it works. You know, you, can't, they, you couldn't just drive up to, contrary to the Flintstones, you couldn't just drive up to McDonald's in your rolling car and pull up, you know, get food. She said, we're, we're made to handle starvation. It's actually good for you. A little bit of starvation is good for you because it gives your body a time when it's not having to process food, it can fight off all sorts of other things that are attacking you. And she says, it builds resistance in us. It makes you stronger. And so she said, you can get the same results if you'll just do what's called intermittent fasting. And intermittent fasting is basically just eating only during a six hour window every day. So I started doing that three days a week. I would only eat between 12 noon and 6 p.m. And some of you guys are like, oh my gosh, that seems impossible. But here's the beautiful thing about it. I could eat pretty much whatever I wanted during that 12 to 6. But then I gave my body time to rest. And as it had time to recover, well, first of all, I lost 20 pounds without even trying. And I didn't even have to cut out Dr. Pepper. It's, Emily, quit rolling your eyes. She's like, Emily judges me every time I drink a Dr. Pepper. But hey, man, I just didn't eat for 16 hours. So anyway, all of this stuff happened. And, and, and the thing about it was when I first, like I dreaded fasting, but when I actually started getting into it, I love it. I now only eat during a six-hour window every day of the week. It's, we call it my feeding time. Is it feeding? Is it feeding time for Joel? I dreaded the idea of fasting, but here on the other side of it, I see the results of the discipline of it. And it all started because I knew God was asking me to do something, and I took a step forward and did it. Now, here's the thing about everybody here this morning. It's January 3rd. Second? It's January 2nd. <laughs> and a bunch of you I know this morning are saying this kind of thing right here. I know I need to uh, this year but it's gonna be really hard to do. The doctor has told me that most of my medical issues are because I have my weight. I need to lose that weight this year, but man, it's gonna be so hard to do. Man, I, I know that I have got to conquer this addiction this year and I've gotta get some stuff out of the house that's in there and man, I need to take some drastic steps, but it's gonna be so hard to do. I know I need to confront some things this year that's going on in my family if we're going to go forward, like I just see the writing on the wall, but it's going to be so hard to do. I know I need to change some of my habits. I know I've got really bad habits, and I know it's causing all sorts of other problems, but it's going to be so hard to do. We all have something right now sitting in front of us that you know deep inside you're supposed to do it. And you think, oh, it's a new year. This would be a good time to start, but oh, So we're going to talk this morning about how to do the hard thing that you don't want to do this year. Are you ready for that? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> One person. Everybody else is like, oh, I think I'm getting a phone call. <laughs> the Apostle Paul, this whole year, we're going to base our, base our message off of this, this verse in Hebrews, where the Apostle Paul says this. He says, guys, in Hebrews 11, the verse right before this, he lists off a bunch of people who lived by faith. Like they fought some hard battles, but they came out victorious. They stayed faithful to what they knew was right. And this is what the Apostle Paul said. He said, therefore, since we're surrounded by all these people I mentioned in the previous chapter, he calls them a great cloud of witnesses, people that have gone before us and have fought the hard battle. They've been through starvation and so that we can have the abundance that we've got today. They've fought battles over and you know, around the world so that we can have the freedom today. All those people that we have that came before us, therefore, since we have that, let us, and he starts talking to us. He says, they did their part. Now, here's what you need to do. Let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now, there's two key words in this that I want to focus on. The first word I want to focus on is weight. Because there's two kinds of weight. There's weight that we voluntarily pick up, like when you go to the gym, you pick it up and you do the weight, 
And you're like, and afterwards you're like, man, I feel stronger after that. You're, you feel tired and weak, but a few days later you're like, I can tell I'm getting stronger. It, it, we all know what that looks like, right? Uh, but there's another kind of weight. It's the kind of weight that sneaks up on us. <laughs> and it doesn't make us feel stronger. You know what I mean? There's just stuff that in life that we just kind of let it go and it just kind of sneaks up on us. You get a little slack. You're like, I know I shouldn't be doing that over there. I know I shouldn't be texting that girl, but it kind of sneaks up on you and you're like, oh, but it, oh, and man, it kind of makes me feel, you know, tingly inside when I'm talking to her. And um, there's little things that sneak up, but you know after you do them, they make you feel weak. Like you've been in those conversations where you can tell that like, both of you are kind of exaggerating, and afterwards you walk away, you're like, you feel dirty? I had a lunch with a guy the other day, and afterwards I walked out, I felt so dirty, and I realized afterwards everything he had told me was basically lies, but he had been lying to himself so long, he actually believed the lies, and it just made me feel dirty, and I'm like, I feel weak just being around this guy who's lied to himself so much. So here's, here's my, what I think Paul is saying first is this, look, you, if you're going to win this race, you got to stop doing the things, taking on the weight that makes you feel weak after you do it. There's just certain stuff you just got to say, I'm not going to do that anymore. And if you do it, you catch yourself doing it, admit you've done it, and fix it. If you find yourself exaggerating the truth a little bit, and you feel weak afterwards, stop doing it. If you find yourself constantly in art, uh, feeling like you need to one-up another person because you feel insecure, you're like, man, they did, I can't believe they did that. And that. You need to like puff yourself up and so you talk you know, better, like tell stories about yourself to make yourself compensate and feel better for how the other person's doing. You've been in conversations like that. We've all done that. And you feel weak afterwards. Stop doing it. Now, that's easier said than done because there's a reason we're doing those things. There's deep fears inside of us, deep motivations. But Paul is saying, here's what I think he's saying. If you'll get focused on winning the race, on your race, you won't have to be comparing yourself to others, which is where he picks up here and he says this. He says, let us, uh, let us run the, with endurance the race that is set before us. You're not running somebody else's race. Looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith. Now, this is super important because this word race here is fascinating. I looked it up. The Greek word that Paul used in this is a word called agona. Race equals the word agona, and Paul loves this word. But the actual meaning of the word agona means suffering, pain, resistance, struggle, or a race. So we translated it, let's run the race. But a lot of other versions say, let us willingly run to the struggle that is set uniquely before us. And you know you've got a unique struggle in front of you. Your struggle is not another person's. You look at other people and like, how come they don't have such a struggle like me? Well, you don't know their struggles. But you know your struggles. And he's saying, and you got enough trouble, problems worrying about your struggles. <laughs> so stay focused on what's in front of you. And when you're focused on what's in front of you, first of all, it's going to keep you from focusing on what other people are doing. My life's so much harder than theirs. You don't know that. You don't know. You don't know what pain they're, the price they're paying for their decisions. And most of that stuff you don't see until later down the road. So you stay focused and you say, it says you're going to, so this is what I think he's saying, you're going to suffer and struggle one way or another because you know what? Life is just suffering. That's your good news for this morning, your Hallmark card. <laughs> but that's what all religions and philosophies of the world agree upon is life is suffering. And every religion has an argument about what you can do about it. But Jesus is saying you're going to suffer one way or another, and he's saying this through Paul, so make sure it's suffering for something that gets you something good in the end. You get to choose your suffering. And there's unnecessary suffering that we create for ourselves from doing stupid stuff that's not in wi using wisdom. But there's just some suffering in life. There's no way around. So here's what I, my take. Stop the unnecessary suffering and do your best to find meaning in the necessary suffering. Because there is meaning in the necessary suffering, which is what we're going to talk about in a minute. But so much of our suffering, in fact, in fact I'm, I'm convinced of this. Trying to avoid suffering often creates more suffering than the suffering we're trying to avoid. 
You ever notice that? Me trying to avoid fasting. The mental agony of it is just like, ah. Oh. You say, nobody does that. No. Okay, let me, let me like, I'm going to throw out a scenario. This, this would never happen, but if it, if it ever potentially did happen, just imagine, I mean, this is an example of what I'm talking about. Imagine that there was a group of people that they were unhealthy, large group of people that are unhealthy, eating a lot of food they shouldn't be eating, you know, not working out. And all of a sudden, like a global pandemic happened. <laughs> and everybody's immune systems are weak, right? So what the idea is, is they say, well, everybody's sick and unhealthy. So here's the way to do this. To avoid suffering, everybody stay in your houses, order fast food, and watch TV until this blows over. <laughs> it's not the answer. The answer is we need to get healthy. But to avoid suffering, we say, do this. And then all of a sudden, two weeks turns into two years. And we're still trying to, this, again, purely hypothetical. But <laughs> we're still trying to recover from the suffering we created, trying to avoid the suffering that's inevitable because it just happens sometimes. Right. Yeah. That's right. Some of y'all don't like me right now, but that's fine. Yeah. Th this is the reality of where we're at. In an effort to avoid suffering. And so then the, these, all these people that are hanging out in their house waiting and waiting and waiting. And somebody says, we have a miracle cure. Shoot this in your arm. You'll be fine. Right? Now listen, I'm not attacking the thing you shoot in your arm. I've been shot in the arm. Okay? But then all of a sudden, last week, we have 1 in 20 people in America who have the very thing we've been shot in the arm to avoid. Because you can't get around suffering. You just can't avoid some things. And you'll never outshoot a bad diet. You'll never outshoot a bad immune system. And I'm grateful for medicine. I'm grateful for science. Again, this is purely hypothetical. But <laughs> I'm grateful for medicine and science. And I believe some people, man, if you're in the high-risk age group, by all means, man, if you pray about it and you feel like you're supposed to get vaccinated, do that. But listen. We live in this weird hyper-reality where it's we're trying to avoid suffering. We think we can avoid all suffering, and it's never going to happen. Amen. Amen. So you just got to toughen up. <laughs> That's right. Be wise. I went rafting a few years ago in the Grand Canyon, and this guy goes, as soon as we got off the bus, our rafts were raiding. He said, gathered all of us around our guide, and he said, listen to me. You must become an active participant in your own survival. That stuck with me. You've got to be an active participant in dealing with the suffering in your life. Because he's like, we're going to hit some rapids, and you may get thrown out of the boat. He's like, I'm going to do my best to rescue you. But if you don't take your responsibility in it, I can't do anything for you. You're going to get sucked down the river, and we'll take your lifeless body later. Again, another Hallmark card. <laughs> but this is the reality of the world we live in. You're not going to get around suffering, and trying to avoid suffering often creates more suffering than the suffering we're trying to avoid. So we do all these ridiculous things, trying to avoid doing what we just should know, what our grandma told us we should do, is still true. Okay, enough of my hypothetical. The beautiful thing is, there's a weight that God asks us to carry that he actually says is light. Jesus says, guys, I know you've got to carry a heavy burden, but it'll get a lot lighter if you do it under the strength of my power. You're not going to get around the suffering. It's going to be hard. There are going to be global pandemics. There are going to be horrible things that happen in this world, but you can be confident right in the middle of it because if you cast your burden on me and take on my burden instead, like I'll take yours, you take mine, and you're going to find mine's actually way lighter. He says this, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden. Those of you who are struggling and trying, man, you're just trying, you're, you're living in fear, you're constantly petulantly afraid, you've got all this anxiety that you're riddled with, and he's like, hey, give me that and take what I got for you instead, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. A yoke is what they used to do to put two cattle together so that they could pull um, to, to hoe a, um, a plow, excuse me, wrong word, to plow a field. And he's like, hey, if you'll link up with me, I'll carry the weight for you. 
Link up with me and I'll carry the weight for you. You're trying to do it on your own. And the reason you're so stressed is because you're trying to do it on your own. And he's like, and by the way, how's it working out for you doing it on your own? It's hard. But he says, come to me, man. I'll take care of it and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart and, I will, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Some of you this, this year, this needs to be your, your mantra here. I'm not going to take this on me. I'm linked up with Jesus. I'm going to let him carry that. Because you're going to face suffering this year. A lot of it. It's going to be hard. There's going to be stuff come down the pipe that you never could have imagined. You're like, I thought that was other people that had to deal with that. But you're going to, you're going to face it. And, and right in the middle of that, Jesus is saying, come to me. And this is what I, that, where, where we pick up this last part. It says, if you want to know how to, to do this well, look at Jesus. If you want to know how to do this suffering thing well, like recognize that, man, there's just some suffering in life that we're not going to get around, so how do we shoulder it well? He said, look to Jesus. Look what he did. Because the founder and perfecter of our faith, like he's the guy that is going to make you who you're supposed to be, and he's also the guy who set the example of what perfection should look like in our faith. He is that point in the distance that we get fulfillment running towards. It says, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him, this is weird, endured the cross. Well, the cross wasn't the joy. What was on the other side of the struggle was the joy. Yeah. The promise that there's something bigger going on here. This is necessary suffering. And he says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. He's like, hey, this ain't no thing. And this is, this is the thing. When you finally recognize that life is going to be hard, it doesn't matter anymore that life is hard. What makes it hard for us is right. It's not supposed to be hard, this hard. Who told you that? You got lied to. It is this hard. But Jesus says right in the middle of that, I got you, man. And so Jesus says, yeah, it's going to be hard. The cross is going to not be fun, but I despise that shame. Eh, whatever. doesn't matter. And now... This is the joy that was seated on the other side of it. He is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And it says, consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men that you may not grow weary and lose heart. So the path to overcoming the suffering is, is this. Willingly embrace the struggle. And you know, I talked at the start of this about fasting and the idea that there's fasting actually were made to handle a little bit of starvation, a little bit of deprivation. That's a, a principle of nature. There's a guy named Nassim Taleb, and he says there's three kinds of systems in the world. He says there are systems that are fragile. They break when they're exposed to stress or chaos. You take like a little vase, you drop it on the ground, psh, it's gone, man. Say goodbye, you're not getting that thing back, right? It's fragile. But then there are things that are robust. This stage is pretty robust. You can kick it. Doesn't matter, just kind of stays where it is. But the opposite of fragile is not robust. The opposite of fragile is something that actually would gain from disorder. So he developed this word called anti-fragile. And anti-fragile things get stronger and more resilient when exposed to shocks, volatility, noise, mistakes, faults, attacks, or failures. They actually come out stronger. And you were created as anti-fragile. You're tougher than you think you are. And the stuff that doesn't kill you, it actually makes you stronger. Really. Now, the important thing about anti-fragile systems, there's two keys is, if you treat an anti-fragile system like it's fragile and lock it away and protect it and say, don't leave your house, it actually becomes fragile. If you treat a kid like, oh, I can't, I don't want him to hear those mean things those people are saying, they're going to become hypersensitive to those mean things people are saying and not be able to handle it. You can create fragile kids by overprotecting them. There's actually a form of abuse that's overprotecting. Now, it takes guidance from the Holy Spirit to know what's too much and what's too little. You've got to be paying attention. The other thing about anti-fragile systems is they're only anti-fragile if after they hit a little stress, they take some time to recover. So some of you right now, man, you're like, man, I've been, I've been hitting hard, hitting hard. Like, I'm just getting beat to pieces. Maybe you need to take a little bit of time and, 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 and step away from the stress, give it to the Lord and give yourself time to recover because it's not doing you any good. But the, the bottom line is this. You're not fragile. 
you're actually very strong. And it's not because of any strength that you have in you. It's because God, first of all, created you to be able to handle a little bit of starvation, a little bit of deprivation. It actually makes you more resilient, stronger, and more like the person God wants you to be. It keeps you from cowering in the corner in fear, hiding out in your house, worried about what could possibly go wrong. And there's an unlimited number of things that could go wrong. Life is inherently dangerous. Very dangerous. Very, very dangerous. But yet, somehow, right in the middle of it, God says, I need you to be courageous. He says, the righteous are as bold as a lion. I need you to walk boldly into the future, knowing, yep, there's going to be some challenges ahead. But the guy that's next to me that I'm yoked up with, he's got this. He's hardcore. He endured the cross. He despised its shame. And he's going to show me how I can get through what I'm going through this year. You just got to embrace the suffering. And when you do, you end up stronger on the other side of it. So my encouragement for you guys this year, to fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of the faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising its shame. The joy that's set before you is the very same, well, it's similar to what Jesus had set before him. You have a father in heaven who one of these days, on the other side of all this, <coughs> he's going to say, you did it. You did it. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. We're living for an eternal reward, eternal perspective. And if you just look at this life, Paul said this. The apostle Paul said, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are pretty pathetic because we should just eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die. But he's like, no, 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 no. We have hope in something beyond this life. If you're just living for life, like if there's nothing after life, well, then all this sacrifice and suffering we're going through is really pretty dumb. But we're living for something way beyond that. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we're people, all people most to be pitied. And he's like, but that's not what we're living for. We've got an eternal reward waiting on the other side for us. So we're not to be pitied. And people look at us and they're like, they're so, I, you know, the stuff they endure, you know, and there's nothing on the other side of this, but we know there is. And that's how we hold on. And that's how we're strong. We're like Jesus. We know there's something beyond the veil here. So we endure the cross. And that's what Jesus said. He said, if anybody wants to come after me, you got to deny yourself, take up your cross, that instrument of torture, voluntarily, and follow him. And the crazy thing about it is this. The very thing we've been avoiding doing because we think it's going to cause a lot of suffering, in the end, if we'll embrace it, will often turn to glory. Just like me with the fasting, I just cannot believe the changes it has created in my life. The discipline I never thought I had. I finally figured it out at 40. <laughs> I can do this. And you're no different. You can do this. You, you, yes you, can do this thing that you're saying, I know I need to this year, but... It's going to be so hard. Yes, it's going to be hard. And through it, you're going to have the grace, the strength, the power to get through it because God is the one that's going to give you the strength to do it. And when you walk out on the other side a year from now and you go, oh my gosh, I can't believe how much weight got put off. Now, I'm not just talking physical weight, though I am talking physical weight. I'm talking about that addiction. I'm talking about the anger. I'm talking about that stuff that you've known you needed to confront. And you do it this year, and at the end of it, you go, wow, God brought me through that. The thing I was so afraid to deal with, why was I so afraid? He gave me the grace right in the middle of it, because his grace is sufficient for you, because his strength is made most evident in your weakness. So this year, I would just encourage you guys, man, embrace the struggle. Don't run from it. Don't hide. Don't cower in fear, because oftentimes we create more suffering by avoiding the suffering we're trying to to, anyways, let me end on a PowerPoint there. You guys receive that? Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you that your grace is sufficient for us, for your strength is made perfect in our weakness. So I pray for anyone this morning, if they know this is the year that they've got to fix this, they've got to address this issue, they know this is the year, Lord, and I pray that you would just give them the power to take small steps. Lord, I pray they would aim low. And if they can't get there, just aim lower. Just keep aiming lower as you give them smaller steps, the small steps they can take. And as they take that small step, I believe you're, you're going to bring your power into the equation. You're going to your, take the yoke and you're going to help them along the journey. If you're here this morning, you do not have your relationship right with Jesus. It's the most important decision you'll ever make. 
It's giving over control of your life to the one who actually knows what you, what you need. And so I'm gonna say a prayer in a second. If you have not given your life to Jesus, that's the start of all of this. You need to take care of that. We're gonna say this prayer. If you say it and mean it, Jesus is gonna come in. He's gonna forgive you of your sins, transfer you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. It starts by saying this. Let's say it together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.